N, our new fuel system. We have a new, renewable, supernatural, nuclear powerhouse living in us. An exciting new part of our rebuild is this. We get an entirely new fuel system. That is, we get an entirely different type of energy system to power us for the drive. So how does the fuel system in a car typically work? Well, we have to first get to a gas station and pump gas into a large tank in our car that holds a significant quantity of gas. A fuel pump then takes gas out of the tank, pushing it through hard metal fuel lines along the car that carry the gas to the engine. Before it gets to the engine, the gas must pass through a fuel filter to remove impurities or debris. Then, a, either a carburetor or a fuel injection system draws in the gas and the appropriate amount of outside air for ignition in the combustion chamber. Within this chamber, a spark plug fires, which ignites the fuel, creating an explosion, which then creates the power necessary for the rest of the mechanical assembly to operate. What an amazing system that most of us take for granted. However, it does still have many limitations. First off, we have to mine for crude oil or petroleum, of which there's a limited supply of in the earth. And that is the recycling of remains that were once living animals. Then that crude oil still has to be manually processed and have other things added to it. So this is a limited natural resource available only because something else died that we have to then extract and then process before it can be used. Next, we have many working parts, fuel tanks, lines, injectors, spark plugs, and dozens of other parts I didn't even mention that all wear down or can work incorrectly and need to be repaired or replaced. In a lot of ways, the human body is the same way. We have a limited supply of energy, and we need to continue to replenish it with fuel, i.e. food, that actually comes from something else living that needs to die. The body's mechanisms that convert food into energy can also break down and fall apart, leading to diabetes, insulin resistance, etc., or even needing to be replaced or repaired. We also need daily rest time in order to give everything a break. And this is just the physical part of our body. The same is needed for our spiritual, mental, and emotional states as well. Because of sin, the entire human condition is naturally decaying and dying. Meaning that beyond the age pre-programmed into our DNA to be optimal, anywhere from 25 to 30, after that we're all on a downward trend trying to slow down our decay rate as much as possible. What I'm trying to say is this. All our natural systems have limitations, and they all fall apart. I'm certainly not saying this to be a bummer. If the story ended there, it would be. But it doesn't. First, we get a whole new eternal everything one day. However, we have been born again, which means we are not fully natural anymore. We have been rebuilt supernaturally and now have a supernatural supplement, the spirit of the living God. The caveat is that his presence is primarily spiritual. I say primarily because he can and does bring physical healing and energy to the body. However, his primary concern, as it relates to us individually, is the spiritual well-being of our soul. The spirit is the place where our mind, emotions, and everything else can and should draw from. So if our spirit is strengthened by the presence of the Holy Spirit, and our soul is being renewed and even growing daily, then though our outer self 
our body, is wasting away, we will be full of joy and peace and vitality in our innermost being. The natural man, the person who hasn't been born again, must continuously go to metaphorical gas stations to fill up because their energy comes from outside themselves. It is their lives, their relationships, their vacations, their hobbies, their careers, dining out, dessert, etc. that makes them feel good. It is what energizes them. It is where they get their joy from. They have to. It's the only option. They must find a way to fill up in the world because they are still of the world. But it is not so with us. At least, it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be. Unlike the natural man, our primary fuel tank is a renewable energy source within. It's more like we're a battery-operated car, and our energy comes from a self-recharging battery. But you know, a battery has a full capacity, and a limitation too. We're talking about God, so there is no full. There is no limit. We also don't have to worry about recharging. God doesn't get tired or need to refill the tank. So we're really not like a battery-operated car either. It's really more like an internal nuclear power plant that is being fed continuous nuclear power directly from heaven. And within us, we have an infinite number of explosions of supernatural, atomic size energy capable of allowing us to do all that we could ever desire and more. And since our energy is spiritual rather than physical, it doesn't run out or wear out the fuel lines or need a new fuel filter, spark plugs, etc. It just works and it doesn't break. The Holy Spirit is our mechanic. He ensures that our energy system is always in tip-top shape, ready for whatever the task is at hand. We need to know this and let it encourage us. Have you ever noticed that Jesus began his earthly ministry by first fasting in the wilderness for 40 days? See Matthew 4 verses 1 through 2. This is even though, physically speaking, in his human nature, he was just as human as we are with the same limitations. He was hungry, but the Holy Spirit sustained him. I think one of the reasons he did this is to develop his spiritual muscles to learn how to depend on the Holy Spirit. We still know that it wore him out. He ended his fast by receiving additional ministering from angels. See Matthew 4.11. I'm not saying that you should try such a long fast, but try to fast by skipping a single meal to start, using that time to pray and seek God. And over time, work your way up to build up your tolerance to increased durations. Fasting, which is temporary abstinence from food and even occasionally other recreational activities, is a spiritual discipline activity that helps us to hone our ability to be dependent upon God. This is because we are depriving ourselves of something that we do need and then spending that time, energy, and focus that would have been used to eat to be with God in a dedicated pursuit towards spiritual growth. Scripture speaks repeatedly about fasting as an approved method of drawing closer to God, seeking His direction and guidance about something, and God rewards this type of activity. It is such a staple that Jesus didn't even tell us to do it. He just assumes we will. He says, quote, when you fast, end quote, in Matthew 6.17. And later, after our bridegroom has been taken away, then they will fast. See Mark 2.20. While I think fasting is worth mentioning here, 
I don't want you to think that fasting is the primary goal of my creating this section here in the book. It's not necessary to fast in order to draw energy, power, and strength from God. You can and should do it at any time and all the time, especially whenever you really need it, not just when fasting. But fasting is a deliberate way for you to practice the exercise of learning to sharpen your mind's focus on the Spirit and to do it regularly. And by doing it regularly will eventually help you turn the discipline into a powerful habit. Of even more importance, though, is just that you recognize that the Holy Spirit's presence is not only about leading you to truth, holiness, righteousness, or even just experiencing God's presence. He also empowers us internally for whatever lies before us. He is there to give you the power to do any God-given task or pursuit or desire that the Lord brings you to. By saying you have this massive resource of internal power, I do not mean to suggest that you should not be taking breaks or sleep or taking vacations, etc. Not at all. We should also steward our body well by realizing its natural limitations and not putting undue stress on ourselves, especially not for worldly pursuits. But when it comes to matters of our faith, that is different. Your struggle with sin conflicting with your Christ-likeness, or your role in advancing God's kingdom, or your gospel proclamation to the lost, or your ministering to someone during a critical time, or any other moments in your journey when you will be put to the test, challenged beyond your normal, natural capabilities. We have an infinite power source to draw from. Christians often live defeated because they don't trust in the truths of their faith deep enough. You know this as a truth revealed in the Bible, so it is an act of your faith for you to believe it and live it out. Remember this, when you're pushed to your limit at a critical junction, but you know for a fact that it is God's will for you to be a conqueror over that matter, Rather than retreating to rest, defeated, saying, you'll try again tomorrow, do this. Stop. Pray. Envision traveling in your mind to the depth of your spirit, where the Holy Spirit resides, and ask Him for an explosion of power and energy and confidence and boldness so that you can be strong enough to do God's will in that moment. And then see what happens. Your car is a V12, and it has a turbocharger, and even a nitrous tank. Don't live like you're in a four-cylinder. Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. John 7, 38, Jesus speaking. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. He was speaking about the Spirit, whom those believed in him were later to receive. Colossians 1, 29. To this end I also labor, striving with all his energy, working powerfully within me.